Уважаемые коллеги, давайте начнем. Colleagues, I suggest we should get started. Some of the participants of the panel have warned me that they're going to be late, but I do hope they're going to be able to join us. You see faces you probably recognize if you're interested in the energy sector. Today, this panel is going to be attended both by the representatives of the government, the largest state-run enterprises, the business, and the most prominent experts on energy in our country. The only segment that is not going to be represented as the foreign companies, the only representative of a foreign company as the moderator, who is not going to speak. He's only going to give the floor to other members of the panel. This is due to the fact that the current theme of the Gaida Forum, Russia and the World Setting Priorities, implies that it is the Russian side that has to set the priorities. Just a short announcement, yet another reason why I cannot join the others. And given my assessment to what the prospects are for the world economy is, in two weeks, our company, BP, is going to publish a new updated forecast. So I would hate to use the statistics of last year in my statement. And I cannot use the new statistics until it has been published. Unfortunately, some of our participants cannot hear the interpretation. On the eve of the old New Year, we are supposed to discuss the old issues the Russian energy sector is faced with, as well as the new ones. You're well familiar with the old problems, which are related to a very specific state of this sector of the world economy. It's a cyclical sector and it is monopolized at the global level. And certain countries, it is monopolized even in other sectors, not just oil. But today, we're not just going to dwell on the short-term and mid-term goals to be achieved by the Russian energy. You have probably heard these forecasts during other panel discussions. You're also going to listen to see the goals set before Russia by the highly volatile realities and those markets where Russia has grown accustomed to strong positions, I refer in particular to oil and gas. Today you're going to listen to statements with different time horizons starting from the current problems. Some discussions are going to be focused on the coming century, 100 years. So today, I believe we are going to be able to talk not just about the new model for producing energy resources. We're also going to be able to talk about the new consumption. And to start this discussion, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Kirill Molotov, Deputy Energy Ministry of Russia, who's going to provide us with the context and which the priorities of Russia as said. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'd like to welcome you in this new year, which has come. I'd like to wish all of you success in studying and analyzing efficient management of different fields, different domains. I refer in particular to the energy field. I believe everyone who is attending this session as well versed in this topic and everyone knows about the priorities of both the energy companies and the global energy market. In this regard, since I've been provided this wonderful opportunity, well, the light is still working, there is electricity, I do hope. Everything is going to be just fine. Talking about the global energy market, no doubt all of us understand that 
if 30, 40 years ago we could operate with five-year plans quite easily. Right now, our new goal is 10 to 15 years planning, and this is the goal we pursue. Based on our understanding of the market, we've got to understand what the global implications are going to be of our decisions, what emphasis has to be done and where it should be put. I refer to all the energy-related matters. Certainly, we cannot escape the impact of such a concept as energy security, energy sufficiency. These are the priorities that are going to shape the prospects of the world economy for the coming century. As has been mentioned, I believe that 2030, 2035, that should be our priority in studying these issues. Uh, these are the priorities of the Russian government and the experts who participate and the planning process, they help us shape our position. Talking about 2030, 2035, I cannot but say that developing in a global context, we have to say that our population is growing, the middle class is growing as well. They have certain standards, certain requirements, and according to our estimates, Right now, one, more than one billion people on Earth live without electricity, and this has to be taken note of. The current consumption per capita has the potential of growth by 15, by 18 percent, if we stick to the moderate scenario. But we believe that the demand for energy resources and other resources, mostly non-renewable, such as hydrocarbons, so this demand is going to grow. Right now, daily consumption of hydrocarbons has more than 90 million barrels. According to our estimate, the consumption rate might increase by 20, 29, 30 million barrels a day in the coming 20 to 25 years, and that's the positive scenario. And these are the figures we're going to factor in when strategizing, when creating conditions to satisfy the increasing demand, certainly. The executive branch has certain priorities. We need to satisfy the domestic demand, the demand, and our allies participating in the world energy market. The Russian oil and gas industry has been very dynamic. Last year's statistics shows us that we've hit a record in terms of oil production and gas production. I believe we're going to hear about that more. We've got the potential, we've got the necessary resources, and we can sell them at the global energy market in this regard. It's certainly going to be important where these resources are going to be channeled, no doubt. For art, we need to develop the modalities for transportation of hydrocarbons in different formats, through pipelines, through intermodal transport, through railroads. We should also think about increasing Russian presence in the markets of LNG and in the pipelines transporting natural gas in its natural form. Our priority, which we are actively pursuing, is the Asian markets and the European markets. I've got to say that our presence is going to increase. We're going to increase our share. We're not yet sure whether it's going to be higher than 10 percent or even higher. It will all depend on the technologies which we are actively developing domestically. I believe that all goals 
technological goals we said before us are going to be achieved. This is certainly going to depend on how much time we've got, what our objectives are precisely, but please let me assure you that despite what our critics say, we're going to observe the deadline which we have set forth for ourselves. I'd like to take note of the presence of my colleagues, Sergei and Grigori. I've got to say that the prospects for using hydrocarbons, the prospects will depend on how much of it is consumed in the transportation markets. I am not sure whether we're going to discuss that with Grigori, but I don't think that the potential of electric cars is so great that it's going to change the situation drastically in 20 to 25 years. Certainly, the electric cars are going to have a very important share of the market. It will all depend on the battery capacity, on the speed of recharge. This share is certainly going to grow. But I think that by 2030, the maximum share we can expect for electric markets is going to be 20 percent. And I refer only to the new cars. And it's going to be 60 percent or so of all the vehicles transporting goods on land. And this has to be factored in when we analyze the global energy markets. Another important factor which we've got to account for when setting our strategic goals and pursuing them. We've got to remember about renewables and alternative sources of energy. Let me reiterate, I am a champion of the current market paradigm. I do understand that we are going to keep our share of hydrocarbons the consumption share is going to increase. As far as alternative sources of energy are concerned, according to my estimates, that by 2030, no more than 30 percent is going to belong to alternative sources of energy. This is mainly due to two factors. First, the technologies. Second, the costs of one unit of energy, and this conditions. I believe this logic is going to be promoted as part of the current energy strategy. As you know, we discussed it and the government. It was approved by the Prime Minister, but we're waiting for the last edition of this document. Then it's going to be approved finally. Then it's going to be submitted to the public and it will also going to be submitted to the president. We've got two general plans for the oil sector and for the gas sector until 2035. And the factors that I've enumerated are going to be incorporated in those two strategies. I believe that's about it for the introduction, and I'm willing to engage in discussion. Thank you, Mr. Molotsov. The prospects for any changes and how hydrocarbons are consumed and transportation markets and with regards to what changes are going to come to pass in light of the climate change, we cannot but state certain changes happening especially among the young people. We're going to give the floor to our experts who are going to tell us about the long-term challenges in the energy field. One of our backbone industries, the gas industry, is already facing certain challenges. And these are not just cyclical problems. They're not as simple as the oil price changes, the Russian gas industry is facing issues that are stemming from economic and cyclical factors. We see that right now, 
access has been granted to the market of LNG, and it's only going to grow, and they come in two to three years, so it's quite a natural reaction. We saw it in the past. And there are certain challenges that are going to be addressed comprehensively, geographically, domestically, internationally, structurally. I believe that Valery Golubov, deputy head of Gazprom, is going to tell us what the view of our most prominent gas producer is. Thank you very much for the question, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Let me say from the outset that Gazprom has a company in which the state share is very high, has always seen itself as a company which ensures the secured provision of gas to all the consumers in Russia. As a matter of fact, historically, and as a matter of fact, we have performed this function. There are some advantages and disadvantages to that. There is the upside, the downside. On the one hand, our partners are reinforcing the energy security of our country due to our new partners. On the other hand, they are pushing us from the most profitable markets, such as the provision of gas to industrial consumers. But this is just a normal situation. It's normal for competition. But what is most important for us, and Mr. Molotsov has mentioned that, the imminent task is to adopt the new energy strategy and then the general master plans for the development of gas and oil. These documents also focus on the development of the domestic gas market. For us, priority, it is our priority to understand what the prospects are going to be. As you know, over the last year, Gazprom has concluded mid-term or even long-term contracts for the next five years to provide gas, to build the infrastructure and the different regions of the Russian Federation. These contracts are very detailed and enumerating and listing all the powers, all the spheres of responsibilities. What is the objective of that? The objective is to gasify Russian regions. Right now, the gasification level is 60 to 70 percent. As one of the pioneers, one of the most prominent gas producers, this is not sufficient. Certainly, we cannot achieve a 100 percent level, but we've got to strive for perfection. We have all the potential to achieve an almost universal coverage. Gazprom is the one to perform this function. We still think that the structure that has to operate the distribution system, the consolidation of distributing network. Well, it is required because only part of the system belongs to Gazprom, and the other half belongs to municipalities and regional authorities. There are even networks, and no one is responsible for them. They are operation, uh, they, they are functioning, they are operational, but no one invests in them, and this is dangerous. We've got to address this matter holistically. If all our regions get the necessary volume of gas at the price level that is going to be kept for the coming several years, then it is certainly going to be to our advantage. I'm mostly talking about some preferences and providing gas to our consumers. but. 
the market prices are kept for the industrial producers. They pay the prices which is compatible to the international prices. So once again, gas from sees its number one task as providing gas to all who needs it domestically. We want to raise the gasification level up to 85 percent using new segments, converting the old facilities to the use of gas, and we will need for that additional 200 billion cubic meters. The resources which we still have allow us to do that. We can afford it as far as our export contracts are concerned. For the long term, the situation is quite stable. We are going to discuss that further. Right now, we are witnessing a certain globalization of the gas market. This is not just the European market or the Asian market. What we're witnessing is the emergence of a global market, thanks due to the LNG technology which has been developed. Certainly, all the forecasts that have been voiced, the forecasts about the EU independence of Russian gas have been nothing but a declaration. Last year, we provided 173 billion cubic meters of gas to Europe. That was a record. Despite all the sanctions, they still buy our gas, and quite voluntarily, too. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about our new transportation capacities, but that's going to be part of my answer to another question that you're going to ask. Now, as for our priorities, let me repeat. We want to satisfy the demand of our domestic consumers, and we want to work with our partners so as to develop the gas market of Russia. And the first priority is to ensure energy security through gas in Russia. Thank you very much. I don't know which is going to be best, whether I should ask questions right away or not. Well, we are going to ask questions to Mr. Molotov afterwards. But the thing is, we are going to go further and further into the future as our discussion unfolds. So I believe there is some point in asking questions related to short-term priorities right now. And based on that, I'd like to ask you if I understand your priorities correctly. Russia, being a country that has at its disposal one of the largest gas deposits in the world, chooses the Russian market as the main development target. You said that the additional demand in Russia might increase by 200 billion cubic meters, whereas exports for you as priority number two, but not as important as the first one. So in this regard, my question is, what are your assessments of economizing on gas. We have experts here who say that gas is not being used efficiently in Russia. So additional demand will not necessarily imply additional development. Partner is certainly an idea which is inconceivable. Moreover, the exports are going to grow. You said that last year the exports to Europe was almost 180 billion cubic meters.
and Europe will step up imports by another 100 BCM. So for Gazprom, is this additional demand a priority? Do you want to compete with them other supplies that will be willing to fill in the niche or are you satisfied with the current level of exposure to Europe and you will just sit and watch how they are going to satisfy the additional demand? You know, it's quite a simple question that is obvious to everyone, heads of companies and the company itself s wants definitely to monopolize fully the European market but unfortunately we could hardly have more than 30 percent of stake which is what we are currently having because there are some logistical routes from North Africa from North America and Central Africa and other parts of the world but anyway the consumption increment in Europe by 100 BCM is something we brace ourselves for and uh, therefore we've been bearing it in mind while laying down new pipelines and what is our asset, main asset is the reliability of our supplies direct relationship reduced transportation and overhead costs greater reliability and there's a new function cropping up something that differenti differentiates us from other suppliers for instance we can combine pipeline gas and LNG supplies and that is uh, there's a possibility to do this under one of the same contract like the, the Nord Stream Nord Stream 2 pipelines of ours would not on average only half a year to to make up for the winter maximum consumption peak consumption but it would work and be operational all the year round and we could supplement our supplies with LNG tankers therefore we decided to build an LNG plant on the Baltic Sea because the stretch over there would be quite short and within one day we would be able to supply an LNG batch to Northern European market and shortly a pl an LNG plant in Yamal will be put on stream and shortly we believe that our Chinese partners may develop a liking to a similar model will supply gas via pipelines to them and we also are able to supply additional volumes of gas via from Sakhalin Peninsula Malaysia, Australia, Qatar, all these LNG majors don't have this double capability. Everybody knows the reliability and the cheapness of the pipeline gas. It's indeed a competitive edge of ours. The fact that we have long-term contracts, some of them expire in 2035 uh, and uh, we believe but all the consumers in Europe are conspicuous to us. We deal with them. We're quite late flexible in terms of pricing, therefore we've been able to gain a major chunk of the European market because our shipment conditions are quite competitive and we don't want to give this market away to someone and the uh, main competitor of ours is the United States which is number one which is obvious we are not sure what the first steps of the new Trump administration will be but judging by the preliminary statements of theirs they will step up gas and shale gas production on their soil and uh, all of that can uh, become an important factor for the European ma market. But it's not about domineering of the Americans at the European market, no. <coughs> it's about struggling to get a share in the global Ukraine or the transit stage. Thank you, Valeri.
a number of experts of ours will share their view with us on the long term price cycles that we will not be able to influence ours is a leading oil and gas power and uh, we are to become aware of first what part of our reserves we can monetize and drive benefit and what is the pricing situation for in, in store for us this is what we'll be talking about today we'll move gradually towards the distant future now let me yield to another representative of Gazprom this is Gazprom Neft and Sergei Vakulinko as head of a strategic department of that corporate will provide his vision of how the markets will evolutionize when we were about to talk about this you know initially the mandate was more narrow it was narrow and uh, I, I was told that I only had 10 minutes for my presentation but I can talk about markets for hours 20 hours yeah <coughs> And it was proposed to talk the Paris Climate Agreement and Pact, COP21. This new agreement is supposed, is alleged to be able to change the situation completely, drastically with respect to the fossil fuels market and it's a new page, a new chapter but all these things have been mooted for the last 25 years and 21 is just uh, the number of all of the conferences it's the 21st one, there were 20 more and the Kyoto Protocol was to have expired, it was to expire in 2020 and it's obvious that the results would not be reached and they decided to supplement it with some new framework. A, well, the Paris Agreement is like good intentions, but no one knows how to get there. Like by 2100, the year 2100, the temperature shouldn't rise above 2 degrees since the start of the uh, industrial era but the more ambitious goal is 1.5 degrees cap as a 2 degrees uh, rise will result in desertification the expansion of oceans and uh, climate change and uh, warming and cooling in some of the regions and the meltdown of the permafrost uh, and there will be emissions of methane as a result the agreement takes effect and it may influence the policies, national policies, although the implementation mechanism is not prescribed in the agreement. If we give an attentive look to what are the causes of the climate change, it's not only about CO2, though CO2 is the major contributor. Uh, the laymen believe that the main contributor is the transport sector. Indeed, the Western voters see uh, millions of cars with uh, smoke coming out of the exhaust pipes, and then they read about e cars and clean energy, and they think that Tesla will be the silver bullet that's going to save them. But this diagram demonstrates it's not quite the case in transport accounts for only one seventh part of the total CO2 emissions and uh, well the burning of oil oil is motor fuel and engine fuel is what interests me as an oiler oil has a very high calorific value you can get much more calories of thousands of kilometers out of oil than out of hydrogen or compressed gas or uh, a battery 
but if we switch to e-cars, the overall impact may become uh, even graver, because net consu consumption of electric power will go up, and the dirtiest kilowatt is uh, that of the coal-run plants, and Volkswagen made one of the same uh, cars running on diesel or electric engine, and you can assess the consumption and the CO2 emissions uh, as a result of production of uh, one kilowatt. And um, while well their energy balance, energy mix is quite advanced, it comprises coal, gas and water, only, only in this case uh, uh, an e-vehicle can be comparable comparable to a uh, diesel engine, but that is so far not the industrial industrially produced samples. We should increase the output of batteries by uh, two orders of magnitude, and there are not enough new battery production plants devised and planned for construction. There is another important thing about lithium. How much lithium do we have, you may ask? Well, some may believe, some people may believe that there is a lot of lithium on our planet. It's a very light metal and in the there is a lot of lithium in the crust but you know, it was d it is dissolved in the ocean, the sea water, very low concentration, and some it sometimes is present in China, in Oz, or in lakes in South America. And all the lithium on our planet will not be sufficient to feed the e vehicles fleet, and we will need more lithium to store energy if we want to transfer to wind and solar power. This is like food for thought for you. And if we believe, second, if we believe that oil is a politicized fuel, and uh, you know, uh, those who will oil can dictate the will to the ma humankind. Oh yes, but you know, the lithium reserves are concentrated in very few areas, which is another drawback. Uh, well, coming back to the layman's opinion of the uh, petrol cars being the main contributors to emissions, no, it's not true. It's about CO2 from coal-fired power plants. Uh, these power plants for, from four countries only emit more CO2 than all the vehicle fleet of the globe and we deal with billions of cars and as regards the uh, coal-fired power plants these are only hundreds of facilities the cheapest means to limit the CO2 emissions would be like doing something with the power plants handling them like Germany wants to make, to attain a green nature to the economy, to go green. But there can be two uh, ways to transfer to the green uh, power. You can either supplement coal generation by gas fired plants or invest hundreds or thousands of billions of dollars installing solar panels and now they have chosen for the second path and at this point of time they've been burning brown coal lignite in the meantime like shifting to alternative energy, we must face it and accept that it's fraught not only with economic, technical and environmental problems, but also with social-political 
factors that are to be taken into consideration if it, an expert government is in power. Okay, go and struggle against coal-fired plants, but uh, there are politicians that get re-elected every four years and they will do as their uh, voters want them to do and the voters want to see the green agenda on the table and they want to see more e-vehicles. As well, as the, the second point is that starting with 07 and 08, all the Western or most economies in the world don't have new fresh investment ideas. The economy has been stalled, although monetary stimuli are in abundance and the new energy is something novel and Keynesian in nature. It's like creating a new industry with high-tech uh, jobs and high-skilled jobs. Like in 2030s, Germany and America wanted to reinvigorate the economies by building aut automobile roads and now people want to construct more solar panels and uh, produce more batteries to restart the economy after the Great Recession, which is an important consideration, and uh, the point is that no, no one cares that alternative energy can be loss-making. Yes, in a, in an error perspective, it's loss-making, but it may benefit the economy by and large. And uh, the third point is that over the past several years, the energy agenda has become quite politicized in the alternative energy. At least they promise the advocates they promise much more autonomy and independence. Full independence from the supplies. This is what professed. But um, very many materials that are needed to turn out items needs much more. Uh, materials and supplies than the traditional energy sector but you know not, uh, laymen don't care about this how it's gonna be introduced you may wonder an aggressive carbon tax which run counter to WTO principles is on the table the country that produces hydrocarbons like this is hand wringing you know if they levy this tax on the on the producers and compel them to pay same rates as they have at home i mean the consumer countries and now with the advent of trump and with the environmental protection agency in the united states they probably may uh, fold it back a bit or backtrack on that but that mechanism would make countries more responsible in their attitudes if we speak about what the real systems are it's like carbon capture and storage uh, system the point is that these are quite expensive now and second is you know no one that no one knows what to do with the captured co2 it must be pumped somewhere no one knows where and last slide of mine comprises scenarios of the future of ours we know that none of the measures shall be done if we want to attain the paris agreement goals i mean two degrees no more And we have several scenarios to help that happen. There may be five leverages to push to reduce CO2 emissions. Some of them indeed are linked with the lower consumption of fossils. And each will require considerable investments from the humankind or considerable reduction in what is consumed and uh, uh, reduced living standards which will be a disastrous political decision and I'm not sure whether politicians will 
have the nerve. But while have we been speaking and thinking of all that, in the upcoming 15 to 20 years, all these measures will yield absolutely almost no effect. But for us, it's of importance to see an image of the world beyond 20 to pay back. But uh, is it worth thinking about this? Or shall we switch to something else? As a matter of principle, oil is indeed in abundance on our planet, though now it's controlled by the OPEC cartel. If OPEC starts thinking that the oil age is coming to an end, they may change their approach on how to sell the oil and what the pricing should be. We understand that technical, economic and environmental reasons to change things drastically now are absent, but the policies may result in a new approach, the politics may result in a new approach, and in this case countries will behave differently from last slide you presented three scenarios, but for your company to us, what is the assessment of yours as per the probability of these scenarios? Frankly, each of these scenarios seems quite pricey to us. We believe that this, this will require a lot of costs and efforts. We tried to come up with our own scenarios that would seem realistic and uh, each of these requires overwhelming costs. The site wouldn't accept that and we haven't been able to find something appropriate. Technically the, la the last scenario would be the simplest, make energy quite expensive, like victims and their progress to be in line with the third scenario. But this is my view, I will not forestall events, I'll just yield to Grigori as I previously said. Thank you, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure for me that today we are discussing such important matters. And the fact that e vehicles and technical technological challenges are discussed makes me pleased because uh, you know several years ago these questions were not on the agenda and today relevant ministries and companies start thinking whether mm, they should invest somewhere and what the priorities can be as regards technology. Let me cite an example of Nokia. Uh, well, it was my favorite phone, but when this, uh, with the advent of smartphones, that they missed. Nokia swiftly lost its value and it was purchased by Microsoft and the top management bought them and uh, ourselves are at the backyard unfortunately so the technology so the sector leaders may miss technological revolutions and uh, lose their leadership a couple of words on leadership there are some challenges that are obvious to everybody, like greater uh, supply in the shale revolution, great energy efficiency, demand revolution, and the fundamental ch changes of the market are in progress, uh, and probably the uh, abandoning of the oil indexation in the gas market. We see the attitudes to our energy at different markets like the sanctions sanctions and the third energy package like today competition is tightening at global markets and uh, thanks to a number of reasons and we all know that the quality of our mineral reserves is 
deteriorating and we have to deal with tight oil and gas which raises the costs and there are different barriers set in legislation and regulations investment appeals of the sec appeal of the sector goes down the technological backwardness doesn't mean that we are hopeless no but you know there are some gaps that we have not only about production but also about consumption of energy gas saving gas saving energy efficiency on the agenda we have some room for advancement there and being an employer I may tell you I can tell you that the new generation of specialists entering the labor market is very low is below and beneath all expectations and that should be dealt with and sorted out somehow as regards the relationship between our domestic energy policy I'm referring not only to the governmental policies but also the strategies of our companies all of that should take into account domestic and external challenges and our vision of the f future of this sector should condition our strategies if we believe in the bright future of hydrocarbons and very good demand picking up that would entail one strategy and we've been entering new markets we've been trying to promote shelf or an offshore production if the demand is slowed down if there are alternative sources cropping up the concept I believe should be changed or at least we should start thinking of improving the competitive environment and ch changing the set of priorities what the current technologies are they are the talk of the town and everyone knows them and uh, most of the risks related to the breakthrough technologies play uh, negatively with respect to the pricing situation consumption any new technologies such as gas hydrates or kerogen are still being tested there are technologies that have already been commercialized they're affecting the supply the demand side is also very important but however that may be there is the status quo the situation which we've been witnessing for the last 10 20 years when the oil consumption was growing quite rapidly by 10 million barrels daily everything can change in an instant as we know a new technology is the electric cars Certainly, it's a topic which is very in vogue. Last year, we talked about that during the previous panel, and we were saying that Tesla was no more than a toy for the rich. And we said back then, we'll live and see what's going to happen in five years or so. Right now, we come to understand that in two years or so, there is going to be 50 or more models of electric cars including hybrid cars, but I'd like to pay attention to something different, despite a growing consensus that the population is going to grow, the economy is also going to grow, the number of vehicles in use is going to increase drastically as well by 2030. And still, the electric cars are not going to satisfy that growing demand. Mostly, these are going to be new traditional cars, but more efficient. They're going to account for one third or so of the increase in the number of vehicles. There are new technologies being used in the cars that we see in the streets, but 
This is not everything the inventors have come up with so far. It's just a fraction of the technologies right now available to us. As far as the electric cars are concerned, so far it all boils down to whether you believe it or not. Some say, I believe, I think, that this is going to be 6 or 10 percent share but if you want to get that share, you need at least 30% of new sales, but that's quite realistic. And in the coming three to five years, we will know whether that's realistic or not, whether this share is going to increase or not. We'll see if electric cars are competitive without subsidies from the state. Yes, that is the factor of the most impressive uncertainty. But, however that may be, the technological improvement is going to offset that. There are different forecasts for the consumption. We believe that the oil consumption is going to reach a plateau and then is going to decrease. How fast it decreases will depend on the share of electric cars. I'm not going to dwell on that. Sergei has touched upon how clean the electric cars are. These issues are subject to discussion. However that may be, I'd like to emphasize. If some think that electric cars are not going to play an important part, but well then, hybrid cars are going to play a role. In other words, it's very hard to make a prediction. We will live and see. As far as the prospects of oil consumption are concerned, they are less optimistic, so to speak. Mostly it's about gas. No one tries to contest the fact that the exports of gas are going to grow to Europe. Our gas is more competitive, and should the oil, sh should the gas price increase from six to eight dollars, our projects are going to be competitive, not just as compared to Europe, but also to the U.S. It all will depend on the structure of demand. We we'll live in see now as for gas. Hydrates. I can say that so far it seems more like science fiction, but works are being undertaken to develop these new technologies. The Japanese and the Americans are experimenting. The technology they have come up with can be commercialized. So far it's a secret, but probably it's going to work. I don't know whether the costs are high or not. But I think we cannot rule out that sooner or later this technology is going to hit the markets. Yet another thing, the renewable sources of energy. Several years ago, it all seemed like science fiction as well. Then subsidies were allocated, but right now that the subsidies have been repealed, the construction of new renewable energy capacities has slowed down, even though there are some exceptions. I we can cite the example of Denmark. Recently, a tender was won to build a wind park offshore. It's one of the most expensive constructions of this kind. This is a precedent. We can argue whether this station is going to make Denmark anchor losses or not. However that may be, we, we, we see this dynamic. We remember 
how much it costs to generate energy using solar panels 10 years ago and how much it costs right now. Alternative energy is becoming cheaper, whereas the traditional sources of energy are not getting so. Of course, it's not going to happen. The drastic changes are not going to happen the next five years, but in 10 to 15 years, we can expect huge changes. A couple of words about our resources, about the minerals. Right now, the Ministry for Natural Resources is elaborating a strategy for the use of our natural resources. One of the tasks set before us is very important. We try to factor in different things like whether this is going to be used in the regions, how much we can count upon our resources, what the markets are going to be like. All this has to be factored in when we plan any geological surveys or trying to increase the efficiency of mining. We cannot lose sight of it. Let me cite the example of oil. If we have a look at it, you'll see the old regions are trying to increase the level of exploration, the level of mining, to take as much as possible. They come up with road maps or and access to their strategies. And when they do that, they have to understand the mechanisms they're going to resort to to achieve their goals. In new regions, emphasis has been made on geological surveys. But bear in mind the global trends which we are witnessing or which might happen. It is of great importance to make a decision in which region you want to operate. Do you want to go to the Arctic right now and to work there on the shelf? Or maybe you should wait and see if the oil price is going to rise or it's going to drop. On the contrary, is it going to be profitable to do that? Because we do not want to spend money just in vain. We want the resources to go where they are needed. Another important thing which has to be reflected in our strategic documents is the development of technologies as compared to other countries. We have never paid any particular attention to developing our technologies. There are many examples, not just hydrocarbons, also environmental technologies. There are direct stimuli to develop technologies, not just for certain companies, but for technological development on the whole, like the driving forces behind the shale revolution. And I think this is something to be reflected in the documents. And now, to sum up, I'd like to say Everything boils down to what the leadership believes in. If they think that this or that scenario is going to be implemented, if they believe in this scenario, then they've got to act accordingly. No one will argue that we need a predictable, stable taxation regime we also have to develop technologies even if oil prices drop significantly in 10 years after day. We learn to, to, to get resources from new sources. Then it's going to raise our competitiveness. Getting back to how probable these changes are going to be. We, we don't believe that there will be no need for oil, that everything is going to be green. And yet, we have 
to remember that this cannot be ruled out. It's sort of a bet. And we have to understand that should this happen and should we fail to do anything beforehand, we are going to be the losers. And this is something to be provided for in the state policy. And if the price increases, then that will mean the bet has been successful. So right now the fact that stress scenarios have been abandoned when developing policy is a bad thing. We have to, to do that, probably not the, make them public, but still. Thank you. Since Mr. Molotov will have to leave very soon, I'll make some amendments to my plans. I will not ask him to sum up. At the end of the session, I would like to ask him to give his reaction to what he has heard, to what has been said about the new challenges, the white swans, the, the black swans, which have just been mentioned by Grigori as an official of the energy ministry, what do you agree with? What do you think the swans are? Not just black swans, the nightmares, which are not to be talked about. And what are the things you'd like to use to set the priorities for the Russian energy policy in future? Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleagues for speaking up for expressing their opinion. I have listened to four factors that have been raised. The first factor is energy efficiency. This is certainly something we are going to study actively, something we are going to pursue. We want to, to raise the efficiency. These criteria, these parameters are going to serve as a priority for our strategies and for the energy ministry as a whole. The second factor, which has been mentioned by my long-standing friend Grigori, is that oil and gas companies have to turn into energy companies. That is a very important factor because that means that we need a new approach to our energy mix creation. The link between coal-generated energy, oil-generated energy, the oil market, everything that affects us, that has an impact upon what we do. These links and their interconnectedness and their impact upon the adjacent sectors like the energy, the efficiency, all these things are a priority for the domestic policy, not just the energy policy. And I think our companies are moving forward in that regard. This approach is being formulated step by step, and I think it's going to be become more pronounced in the coming five to ten years. A lot will depend on external factors, but internally companies are getting ready for that, and we're going to promote that. The third factor, which is also of great import, as related to the priorities of our domestic market, such as ensuring that our consumers, our population, get the necessary resources And based on that, based on what has been mentioned, we can raise the efficiency, lose le use less to produce while producing more. And the fourth factor, which is most important. I think it has to be promoted by everyone. I think this has been discussed uh, within the framework of the Gaida Forum. It's the economic growth and the development of the energy sector as part of the economic growth. As you know, oil and gas companies are socially responsible companies. They think about the population. They have to do that. And we must remember that economic growth goes hand in hand with 
an increase in energy consumption and oil consumption included. So we have to understand that to satisfy the demand of the domestic market, the Eurasian market is our priority, which we're going to pursue, well, at least until 2025, but probably beyond that as well. These are the four priorities which we're going to implement in our strategic and short-term goals. I hope I have responded to your question. Right now, I'd like to give the floor to Leonid Grigoriev, who is responsible for the energy sector in the Center for strategic research. Right now, he is responsible for elaborating the long-term development strategy of Russia. Let's listen to what an NGO representative has to say about this matter. He is very knowledgeable and he knows a lot about the priorities of the energy policy. He'll tell us about the challenges that emerge in the world energy and how all that fits together. Thank you. Thank you. As far as I understand, all the principal matters have been addressed. Only the economic, the energy matters are outstanding. So if you don't mind, so as not to overlap with what has been said, I'm dwelling a little bit on the energy, the economy, and the environment. Let me start with electric cars. I'm always asking when the battery, the good battery, finally is going to be produced, probably in 2022. But the question is, where are we going to go using this electric car inside Russia? I think the first highway is going to be used to get to St. Petersburg from Moscow and to Helsinki and then to Berlin, to Poland, then to Nizhny Novgorod. Next step is going to cover the so-called golden ring of the Russian cities because we will produce these conditions for foreign tourists and they will have all the necessary conditions to, 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 to go there. But what about the Russians inside Russia? We use cars less. We usually go to Oshan and to our dacha. Yes. But the weather conditions are so harsh in Russia. What will we do should our electric vehicle fail. The roads also leave much to be desired. Of course, I think electric cars are going to appear in Russia, but mostly in large cities. The cheapness is going to be a factor. But let's remember that it's not going to address all the matters. Another aspect I'd like to dwell upon. We want to come up with something new, but we usually fail to do that. The strategy we, we, we talked about, it was supposed to be adopted in autumn, but we didn't do it. I do hope that in February or in March, the strategy is finally going to be adopted, which will spare me the... As I said, which will help us. The goal of the strategy is to spur economic growth but so far, we do not see the sources of this growth. I think we, we've we got many resources, like 20 gigawatts of energy capacity. It all depends on the pressure, on the load, 
then Gazprom has additional 200 billion cubic meters. But it's not as simple as that, because there is competition, there are other factors to be taken into account. I think it might affect how the relations of the companies are developing, but this is not going to affect the economy in general. If we look at how the development is going to go forward until 2030, 2035, I think we, we've got this forecast. We, we work together. We presented our analysis here and in Washington, and we're also going to every yard. The energy sector is always lagging behind the rest of the economy. Once you raise the energy efficiency, then the certain issues arise. We know what's going to happen in the renewables. But physical increase in consumption, energy consumption in the country is going to lag behind the economic growth, however you look at it. And if we want to hit the 3 or 4 percent target for our economic growth, then the energy consumption is going to go at lower rates. The energy sector is very strong. Companies are very strong. They serve as a source of revenue for the state budget, both in regions and at the federal level. Five to six percentage point of capital investment is in the energy sector. The savings norm is 20 to 22 percent, sometimes it's up to 24 percent, but only in fat years, during crisis, this norm decreases a little bit, but not too much. Moreover, during crisis, the investment into energy increases because, as compared to other sectors, it's doing better. Indeed, we can see that Russia is investing 6% of world investment into the energy sector, and the energy ministry is sticking to that forecast regardless of the prices. We account for 10% of all energy and 6% of the investment. We consume five of this energy ourselves, half is exported. And we also export machinery. And there is the statistical tweak we've got to account for when something is produced in Russia but accounted for in Europe. We, we've got study by Makarova and Sokolova. You can look into it and understand what I'm talking about. If we want to spur the economic growth, removing our dependency, then then this has to be factored in. As I said, this study is freely available on the Internet. You can access it. And if we do that, if we pursue this independency track, then our investment into energy is going to slide, drop from 5 to 6 to 3%, and the investment is going 
to have to be redistributed to other sectors. But if the money is st stays there, then the sector is going to buy new energy efficiency equipment. It's all about the transportation, the consumption. So if we want to raise the energy efficiency, then it's going to affect the proportions of growth between different sectors and also between different regions. It's clear that those who live in the current economic conditions advocate business as usual approach. But the ministries and the government understand that we've got to move somewhere. On the one hand, we want to get away from energy dependency. On the other hand, we want the energy sector to continue to serve as a strong component of our budget. And that is the dilemma that we are facing. I'm not going to dwell upon the risks or the challenges that have already been mentioned. So in this situation, our plan B is not to wait for a good energy price. We cannot anticipate how the prices are going to fluctuate. So my message, if I still have time, and I agree with Grigori. We have to come up with a hybrid strategy. That's the word which we now often use to describe it. We have to take advantage of the strong suit of this sector. It is very competitive, it is very profitable, and it has to serve as the basis for modernization. But at the same time, we've got to achieve independency from this sector. In other words, we've got to redistribute our investment from the energy to other sectors, to other industries and branches. Probably this money is going to flow into the financial sector, which, let me remind you, as a poor side. Our banks cannot even get any good loan from the BCBS, and it's just ludicrous how weak our banking sector is. And banks do not invest, they do not make any investment. And it's absolutely different. It's not like in the Anglo-Saxon countries where banks invest long money into different sectors. Look at what is written about the financial sector and the bonds and the strategy of 1998. There is a mistake there, however, because they confused the real GDP and the nominal GDP. So they forecast the financial sector by 2005 and by 2020, 20%, but 20% as compared to the nominal GDP, whereas by 2020, the nominal growth is not going to be at 7%. That would be unrealistic. It would have to increase the GDP 20-fold or so. Hmm. So, I, so I believe it's about long-term funding cycles and bonds issues. But anyway, inside, our companies we should have a contingency plan, plan B, and plan C also, and plan D if the price soars, which would be a quite a different story. And my proposal was simple. Let us come up with the concept of uh, secondary national projects, 
But what we'd like to do if we have money, or if we have more revenues, where would it be channeled? I wonder. The previous um, uh, revenues were spent on pensions, defense sector, capital flow, outflow. And and there was a long, long, t uh, there was a colossal boom of consumption of um, um, long-term items like uh, white goods, computers, cars. Consumption of these items boomed. This is why we weathered the crisis quite okay. And the official propaganda missed it. So what? Well, the, about uh, financial buffers. It's not about. It's not my topic. It's not my focus. Ask Kudrin. Instead, I would uh, make a list of secondary national projects, like maybe regional development or human capital. I would block money for that. and appropriate it for something useful later on if the price is above the threshold level but so far it's only <coughs> talks and uh, CCR is not a center, it's an epidemic once every several years it starts turning out I ideas. Let's wait and see what comes out of it. The key issue is that we can't have growth without energy and modernizing thereof. And we need to have the economic strategy so that oil and gas uh, sh sector share in our GDP goes down. As regards climate conference and uh, the Paris Agreement, I'm quite skeptical. I believe these are weak measures. Like, it's a consensus that we can't. Uh, achieve any tangible results and it's a consensus that people concur to this in five years I believe monitoring exercise will be carried out and um, it will recognize that it has been a failure or even if there is a global cooling in this case is going to be even easier but global warming is not about degrees it's about uh, natural calamities and disasters. But we need to start modernizing our economy and ch change technology paradigm anyway. Thank you, Leonid. We have lived and listened to the private view of a person in charge of uh, energy policy at the cons at the uh, strategic center and the final speaker will be the one who dealing with energy for at least 40 years we can have a plethora of views at a panel and I believe that now probably we'll ha listen to something different, something else. Igor Bushmakov. Igor Bushmakov, Russian Center for Energy Efficiency, Executive Director. Uh, I studied with Igor Gaidar in parallel groups on the uh, same year, and I n knew Igor quite well. Mm -hmm. 
when we speak about climate, we have to understand several important things. If we go along the traditional business as usual track, we will see uh, growth in greenhouse gas exposure in the atmosphere. The global warming will have the parameters of four to six degrees, additional degrees uh, on average, and the northern zones of Russian Federation, the warming may be 10 degrees which is a disastrous and very dangerous a scenario. Mm. And it's going to happen if by 2100 all greenhouse gas emissions doubles, increase by 50 gigawatt tons. To stay within two, figure, uh, two degrees figure, we should not increase by 50 uh, gigatons, but reduce it by 50 gigatons. Or even go in the neg on the negative territory, tread on the negative territory. There are some technologies that allow us to remove carbon from the atmosphere. We're not able to launch it like in 2020, but in 2100, 2100, it may be quite plausible. Well, the Paris Agreement, there are very many s skeptical people about it, but I'll show you that it's going to be... Skepticism may have disastrous consequences, and on the slide you can see the bars that will demonstrate the effect of the reduction in emissions. In blue is energy efficiency, in green is green energy. Well, uh, around 2030 will be in the uh, orange area, not in the blue one, which is insufficient to st uh, switch to a trajectory that would prevent us from adding more than two degrees to the average temperature. And to this end, we need considerable changes in our economies and energy sectors. Here you can see two groups of trajectories in pale color is growth as per business as usual pattern and in darker shade you can see the scenario to maintain within two degrees and it's uh, these are two opposite scenarios. So we will need to drastically change our industrial systems and our buildings and everything and power sector and all the rest things this will not hap happen overnight the dotted line shows the level of uh, 2100 by 2030 the changes will be limited and the, the farther the bigger and all companies say that they need considerable horizons to plan their business activities. Therefore, when we decide upon such major issues, global issues as climate change and warming, or ozone layer stabilization, it takes time to resolve these issues. Thanks to the Montreal, Montreal Protocol, there is a possibility that we will go back to levels of uh, 20... 1970 as per the ozone layer by 2050 so it takes seven, 70 years or 80 years if we speak about the transformation of the global energy sector there are many different opinions but this graph demonstrates calculations of three model groups from different countries the baseline in, in black and green and blue, it's oil, coal and gas uh, respectively. We'll see that oil consumption will grow. Anyway, it's going to grow in the baseline. But if we speak about stabilization, climate stabilization, or retention within two degrees, we see what starts going on. The gray bars on the right reflect the energy, great energy efficiency and yellow and orange 
the renewables and uh, the energy mix structure is on the right hand side our companies should think start thinking that <coughs> After a while, they will be uh, required to provide package solutions, their products plus new technologies. And dark blue is biomass plus BCCS plus fossils, and uh, light green is renewables and nuclear. The energy mix would change considerably, but the structure of the changes is similar everywhere demonstrating a trend of how it's all going to happen. These things will not happen on their own and uh, the capital expenditure structure should be should be overhauled. The right bars in, in blue color, the green blue re represents the world in total capital investment or expenditure in uh, uh, renewables and the downward moving uh, bars are organic power generation and production of gen uh, organic and fossil resources versus 2010 so traditional uh, and extractive industries will see less investments in low carbon will see more although many people are skeptical about them the centerpiece here demonstrates the centerpiece graph demonstrates that despite the reduction in oil price over the past several qu quarters the expenditure in renewables maintain is maintained unchanged and what is the tune of these investments 270 billion dollars per annum over the past several years it's, which is the green curve it is manifold on top of the investment in uh, traditional conventional plants and uh, sectors so when we see that these changes are already effective, the future is now, it's not in 2050 or 2100, it's now. And another group of graphs demonstrates uh, investments in great energy efficiency. By 2050 the investment in that will be around one trillion dollars and the graph in between uh, reflects China, EU and US. The light blue zone is something is the reduction in demand thanks to energy efficiency and yellow is the uh, real effective demand. In China there was a growth in demand and in US and EU there is no energy consumption uh, growth they make it up make for it make up for it with the help of energy efficiency now about tyranny towards all this IEA countries demos statistics show that the losses of countries because of low energy efficiency are more than two trillion dollars this is the shortfall of income and revenue. These are real figures. If we speak about economic mechanisms to regulate the emissions, this graph demonstrates and proves that this year 15% or even more next year. will be covered by this so that carbon regulations so far these mechanisms are inefficient 
and from five to fifteen dollars of the price for carbon the overall reduction of greenhouse gas emissions is 1.4 percent the mechanisms are to be streamlined but if we speak about what really provided the main contribution to the reduction in emissions it's energy efficiency and active incentivizing actively incentivizing alternative alternative energy efficiency this is the situation at the external market inside the country as prom expects a growth in consumption of natural gas domestically but for several groups of scenarios the baseline is that it's for the economic development ministry it with underlying low economic growth rates will not have growth in prim primary energy consumption till 2050 as per which scenario the target scenario is the growth rate of the economy of the global scale and in this case the primary energy consumption will be by 2030 it will equal 2010 or 2011 and then keep growing quite slowly by less than 1% per annum so expecting that we will have a greater consumption of energy domestically is you know that would be erroneous then comes price GDP to oil price relationship I haven't given that because uh, although it's interesting but here you can see the share of spending of all the consumers in different countries to the GDP this is a relationship and there are, it turns out several energy constants and the average resulting average is eight to ten percent and countries are different stages of economic development and I can state that which has been the case since 1945 but I can state it's been so for the last 500 years and the cycles are 25 to 33 years no longer moved the peak and now we're on the waning part of the cycle so we could expect another rise in prices in the end of 30s or beginning of the 40s and Sergei said that if energy is becomes expensive people become poor all of a sudden depauperize it's not as simple Isoquant uh, takes the period from 1945 to 2017 with a high priced energy efficiency also increases so there, there is a correlation or well, the cycle lasts 25 to 30 years the adjusted inflation the energy price and energy efficiency have very similar parameters rises or falls low energy price is not a parameter to incentivize and stimulate the economy no only in short term in mid term and long term it'll help you conserve technological backwardness so we should be quite prudent in our policies we should take into account the cycles and if we rise raise the prices abruptly and don't control them <coughs> you'll see that the figures will change respectively the wing function says that the more we go we divert upwards from that trend the more chances there is that we shall enter recession so energy policies are important here and for this country it means that we will not be able to expect any considerable growth in energy including the, you know, the price of oil 
as regards production of oil and gas. Previously, we were more optimistic with respect to gas, and but still the last gas forecast is around 700 billion cubic meters till 2035. Vladimir and I discussed that several years ago. I stated that we'll never exceed the 700 BCM. He s said we will, we would, uh, but no one knows who is right. But if it is true, if oil consumption is stabilized, the consumption to GDP will not grow, and the low, uh, the bottom left-hand graph says that we should double the accumulation rate of our investments. And with the current and projected oil prices, it's it'll be very hard to maintain the current production level. And the Leonid, Leonid said that oil and gas share in GDP will go down. Over the past years, it was around 20 to 25 percent of GDP, and now it went down, and it will go down further on by 2050. It will be no more than seven or eight percent, no more than 10. We will not go back to the same level, and that creates us huge problems because we need quite a different economy. Many people are skeptical about the green economy or low carbon economy, but the world has started moving and heading for for that. And we've been laughing at them, pointing our finger to them, saying that these are fools, but they're moving in the right directions. The, the fools are us, and we run a high risk of pursuing the strategy further on. We'll be in the red present, and the world will edge towards the green future, so we should have a root and branch review of our economic development and the shortfall of income. Not 25% of stake, but 7 or 8 instead, if oil and gas sector is quite active. We need to supplement the shortfall of income with the help of other sectors, and well, the strategy of Kudrin should have a huge component of uh, sustainability and green development and the electric vehicles are needed not to reduce greenhouse gases but to reduce the emissions of the polluting substances in Russia 30 to 50 pe thousand people die as a result of this each year we need e-vehicles to sort out the different problems so no one knows what we've been dis resolving but when we do our best to enhance energy efficiency and develop uh, our energy sector and reduce all emissions and pollution rate, we resolve comprehensively a set of issues. We have great life expectancy, lower mortality and better economics. And I hope that we'll not uh, linger in the red present and we will mobilize ourselves and, and head for the green future. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. We have five minutes left. I want to yield now to the speakers. We have five speakers, so no more than one minute for each. Sum up and say the main points and takeaways of yours, or you may respond if you will. Well, we have now switched to talks about energy strategy of our country, but I would say that four components matter, although we uh, only focus on one. So the four pillars are what is the target of desirable energy st consumption structure of this country. Second, what is the resource base to provide for that? And third, well, our exports of energy brought in a considerable chunk of revenues so what should our society do in this case in the last question <coughs> the 
we have the adjacent industries, what should these industries do? Energy strategy should answer all these questions at best. But you know, it mostly looks at the future level of prices and what should be exported. Shall, shall we move to the green agenda? I'm ready to uh, dispute, to discuss. But if the global agenda m moves forward, makes headway, the relevant value of fossils will go down. But Russia has insufficient solar light and winds are active in those areas that are sparsely populated and shall we anyway me need uh, power plants of solar and wind energy or should we keep burning oil and gas? I will not uh, fit into one minute though. Are there any other wishing to speak? couple of comments on the energy strategy once we speak about this. I believe that the Russian Federation probably wouldn't need such a document. We should come up with uh, outlooks, annual outlook, as the IAEA and EAE uh, do, but not as would any single energy company say whether they participate in this energy strategy elaboration or probably in case they only need some funds from the government or some money and appropriations but otherwise they don't care as the uh, as for the contents of the document uh, what I saw is an inertia driven drafts we like provide equal shares to everybody and it's an extrapolation strategy it's not setting priorities, no, and we should have an image, a clear image and clear vision of what we want to attain, not vice versa. And if we start developing this or that, you know, sometimes it's ridiculous, because some of the trajectories start differently, but then by 2035 they uh, concur in one and the same point. So very interesting how they're able to achieve one and the same objective whatever the path they always converge in one place as far as the renewables are concerned and the energy efficiency a new concept we have places where the wind and solar power are plenty are abundant and there is no electricity and where traditional types of electricity production are very expensive and even heavens dictate that we develop renewable energy there we have started a new project the elaboration of a program where we try to think where new projects can be developed. We need best practices which we will be able to replicate. The fact that we've got many sources of oil and gas doesn't mean that we've got to produce all of them because sometimes the deposits are in such places that they're almost unattainable. Money can be much more efficiently be spent elsewhere and lead to greater increase in the GDP. Thank you. We have talked about hydrocarbons as a source of energy. I am responsible for gas provision to the regions of Russia. So gas is used to produce heat. But the second aspect of our work is Prices in gas as a raw material for gas chemistry. We have not touched upon that yet. I believe we've got to decrease the share of gas production because gas is not a renewable resource. And gas will be required by humanity as a source for chemistry production and 
nothing can replace that. That is why reducing the use of gas for heat production and electricity production is very important. And we've got a paradox here. When we see why our energy efficiency mechanisms are not working, we see that each and every new technology requires investment. A new company and old companies cannot afford to invest additional money to change their energy consumption mix. Gas in Russia is very cheap. It's 10 times cheaper than in Europe. The average price for an Italian consumer is 1,000 euro. Just for your information, each and in every Italian pays 1,000 euros for one cubic meter, whereas we pay 100 tops, and that's what creates this paradox. Many people in, North, in the North Caucasus cannot see why they should pay for gas, because this is a national patrimony. They think they can better spend money elsewhere for other purposes. While the gas price is low, there is no stimulus to raise the energy efficiency to save the energy resources. We've got a very good strategy. And when I was asked what Gazprom was expecting in terms of energy consumption, I said that the consumption would increase by 20 or rather 200,000 cubic meters. But I do hope that the energy efficiency is also going to increase. But there is another problem arising. Do we have the capacity to raise the gas price right now? Are our consumers, um, our companies ready for that? No, they are not ready. And we've got to understand that. Increases in our salaries and our wages due to the current economic condition cannot allow us to raise the gas price and accordingly the heat price. So we are in a bit of a fix. On the one hand, we are supposed to stimulate new investment and to energy efficiency. At the same time, when the raw materials are so cheap, why should we spend money on it, additional money? Why should we invest in developing new technologies? But I champion the need to reduce the gas consumption in our country. Well, at least we shouldn't use it as a source of electricity. Unfortunately, we've exhausted the time limit and we've overstepped our Bounds, so low need, no more than a minute. Thank you. It was very, very sad to look at the slides. You see with sadness that there is no vision for the gas market in our country, and the same goes for the target configuration of this industry. We do not have the priorities set. We have some components, but these are just dots on the map. We do not have a broader picture, either with regard to oil or gas, and we need this picture. Well, it's quite evident that there will be none in the energy strategy, but without having this broader picture, we run the risk of hitting the deadlock sooner or later. And Grigori, please, thank you. Just very briefly, I think we should differentiate between the scenario and the forecasts. The scenario is good, but the forecasts are a different matter entirely. When we see that both the Americans and Russia are going to account for 40% of the 
energy consumption and energy production by 2040, that doesn't mean that there is a conspiracy. This is just based on the facts and the analysis we've got. The green picture is coming from Europe. And this green picture just fades away somewhere at the Euros. Please do not talk about China. I know everything about China. I always study China. Let's be honest. There's he write these scenarios. Just keep doing that. I love your scenarios. But I'm going to work with real facts, with realities. They have done something heroic. They've had the horizontal emissions. They've put a stoppage on emissions. But the developing countries have caught up with them and have overcome them. And out of 36 billion tons of emissions, well, they, they're lagging behind. And Europe is decreasing the carbon emissions. They spend money inside, even though this money could have produced far greater results elsewhere. So these are different things. Well, I'm afraid I have to stop there, otherwise I'm going to speak out infinitum. I'd like to say that I've spoken both to Minister Novak and to Minister Donsky. Ministries have to at least establish very tight supervision over regional energy strategies. They shouldn't build new power plants without first consulting whether they can increase their energy efficiency or the, whether they can transition to alternative energy sources. We, we, we do understand that the current conditions, the current situation can continue like that. And these are the forecasts which we have. We've got to transition to a new model. We cannot have a 4% economic growth if equally in all industries. And the last thing, I disagree with, with what has been said. That's very typical. I'm sorry to cut you, but we have to go now. Thank you. The discussion was very emotional, which means that in future it's also going to be so much fun. Thank you.